from my experience, especially with my research in patient-centered outcomes research and community-based participatory research, I really, really feel as if the practice is what determines the, the outcomes and what we're ultimately looking for. And what I mean by that is within those realms, especially those types of research, it's a really big um it's a really big component to have patients and the community members at the table from the beginning. So even when we are coming up with the research questions to, to begin with, they should be the ones driving the narrative, not us. So that's what I mean by practice-based evidence. They live, like if you have your target demographic, and when I say they, I know some people want to be like, who are you referring to? Your target demographic, they live this every day, the health outcomes that we are trying to prevent or trying to mitigate, they live them every day. They are the experts. They have been practicing this type of, you know, out, whatever it is on a daily basis. And so that's why I say practice-based evidence versus the other way around. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hey friends, welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm super excited for today's guest today, Dr. Giselle Martin. Dr. Giselle Martin, DRPH, MS, MBA, CHES, is an implementation science research program manager at UT Southwestern Medical Center. She's an author, three times entrepreneur, health promotion, health disparities, and policy lecturer, Black wellness content creator, health diversity and community health expert, clinical nutritionist, and clinical excise physiologist. She recently shifted into the Implementation Science Research Program Manager at UT Southwestern Medical Center in the brand new O'Donnell School of Public Health. She's also a professional lecturer at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health in Washington, DC, and is the founder and chief clinical nutritionist at the Viv Wellness Academy, as well as is the founder and CEO of the Health, the Public Health Foundation, a nonprofit geared towards improving health equity by integrating all eight dimensions of well being into health and healthcare services and programs addressing chronic conditions in historically marginalized communities. She conferred a Bachelor's of Biology at Oakwood University, a Master of Business Administration and Healthcare Administration at University of Phoenix, then pursued a Master of Science and Exercise Science at Georgia State University, Clinical Internship and in Clinical Exercise Physiology at Emory University, and lastly got her Doctor of Public Health at Loma Linda University. Be sure to follow her on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at Dr. Jazzy Fit, and check out her website at drgiselmartin.com. In today's episode, you'll hear and learn more about how a nonlinear path in public health is not a bad thing. Taking academia and research and making it actionable to real world challenges. You'll learn about blue zones, what they are, and what we can learn from them in public health, as well as we learn more about practice based evidence and the fundamental of theory and practice, and ensuring that we as public health practitioners are holistically taking care of ourselves, and much, much more. Enjoy today's episode. Hey, this is Dr. Giselle Martin. I am a senior public health scientist, and you are listening to Public Health Careers. Welcome to the show, Dr. Giselle Martin. I'm super excited to have you here today. Thank you, Amari. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to it, digging more into your journey and hearing about your experiences. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to share with the people anything to share. You, you hear that, so definitely reach out, connect with him on LinkedIn, and, and like ask the other questions that kind of come up that I didn't get to get to. So before we get into anything, how do you identify and then tell us a little, a little about your personal background? All right. Well, I identify as a Black woman, so I do go by the pronouns of she, her, hers. I am a minority. I am a first-generation college graduate. I'm a mom, I am a friend, I'm a daughter, I'm many, many things to many, many people. 
I think that's that's important. Uh, we we are not just one thing. We are so many different roles and identities, and that's who makes us who who we are and makes us unique. And what brings I think the diverse ideas that we need in public health and in this type of work. So appreciate you sharing your identities with us. Before we get more into like your story of getting your career in public health and finding out about public health. So people have heard the background that I've read on you previously. So you have an impressive background in academia, having taught at multiple universities. How do you bridge the gap between research, academia, and practical solutions to real world health challenges? Well, so I actually just finished lecturing about this two days ago in class. And there is an intersection between research and application and the practice of what we do as public health scientists. And so it's not this linear, super rigid type of approach that many people try to portray it as. And, you know, there's really no order of stages, even when you're creating a program or even implementing or evaluating a program. Um, so it is literally an interchangeable multi-directional approach between those three different areas. And so the best theories that are out there that we use to create our programs in public health, um, they integrate all of these different areas and they're informed by many different stakeholders, whether it be patients, whether it be community members. Um, and it's not... A, I, I would say that it is more so when it, you come to those three different areas, your research, your application, and your practice, the research is like the, like if you're thinking about a football field and you have your quarterback and your wide receiver and all of them playing the play, and then you have your end zone way down at the other end, the research is like the part between where the game is going on and to the goal. We don't know that stretch of what needs to happen in order to get to the goal. We are kind of making it up as we go along in some cases. And so you, the practice, the play, the actual game, that is being moment by moment impacted by the research and that gets us to the health outcomes that we want. And so it's all this big dynamic chasm of actions that are happening all the time. And so I think that's one of the reasons why me particularly, I'm very, um, I'm kind of a fundamentalist when it comes to understanding the theory, understanding even things like variables and knowing your variables really well, because when you're actually in the field and you're actually implementing pract um, practical applications of the research, you can be more nimble and more flexible and you know, your player over here gets hurt. Okay, we're improvising over here. And you can constantly evaluate and check as you're going along. So hopefully I, that analogy or metaphor actually helped a little bit. I, I think the, the metaphor was definitely helpful and in creates like a fundamental understanding of it. I, I think the question that like just com comes to my mind that might be helpful to answer is like when you're thinking about getting to the fundamentals of a theory to put it out in practice, what does that actually look like? Mm. Okay. Well, I, so I remember when I was writing my dissertation and I, I don't know why this particular quote actually stuck out in my head, why I remember it, but nonetheless, um, the author was green and I believe the year was 2006, but he said that there's a huge need for evidence-based practice or practice-based evidence, rather. And so researchers and practitioners have to, their priorities differ, right? But the relationship between the two is what influences the application. And for me, the commonality that's there is the theory. And so, you know, it's really understanding what theory applies to whom and whether it's an individual level theory versus a community level theory. Um, what are the shortcomings of it? Because sometimes we might need to invent a completely new theory that doesn't 
address what the social ecological model does or the pre seat pro seat model. Um, and so I think really understanding, again, the dynamics of variables and understanding the role of these variables on the outcomes that we're trying to capture is the most important part. And from my perspective and experience, I think that's where sometimes programming goes a little wrong is when you don't understand, you didn't do your homework at the beginning. That made a lot of sense. I'm, I'm like drawing diagrams of my paper across here because I, I, I think like the models that you're, you're talking of make sense and like just to connect it. And many times I think that is what is, is sometimes difficult for, for researchers to see like, how does this actually practically apply? And many times they aren't doing research that is driven at practically applying. And I feel like, especially as a black person, um, I feel like we need to really be intentional in doing work that is actually going to free the communities forward. Um, you corrected yourself. You said initially research, research based practice, and then you changed it to practice based evidence or practice based research. Could you explain why you flipped that? Yes, because from again, these, these are all what I call just cellisms. These are my personal opinions. Um, from my experience, especially with my research in patient centered outcomes research and community based participatory research, I really, really feel as if the practice is what determines the, the outcomes and what we're ultimately looking for. And what I mean by that is within those realms, especially those types of research, it's a really big, um, it's a really big component to have patients and the community members at the table from the beginning. So even when we are coming up with the research questions to, to begin with, they should be the ones driving the narrative, not us. So that's what I mean by practice-based evidence. They live, like if you have your target demographic, and when I say they, I know some people will be like, who are you referring to? Your target demographic, they live this every day. The health outcomes that we are trying to prevent or trying to mitigate, they live them every day. They are the experts. They have been practicing this type of, you know, out, whatever it is on a daily basis. And so that's why I say practice-based evidence versus the other way around. Love it. And, and, I, and, I, and I think about like the framing of ensuring, because we are in the situation, I always say like we are in the situation right now in regards to health and social determinants of health because of the systems that have been put in place because of the people that have been given power to make the decisions in the communities. And many times, as you're saying, we, we leave out communities. We don't listen to their voices. We don't get their input. We don't let them tell us what they need. They're just kind of like a, a second thought. And I think shifting that narrative is what's, what's so important to get to a lot of these health outcomes and to the system change that we want. Exactly. We should be amplifiers. We are not necessarily the voice of the community. Our job is with the megaphone, we come and it's like, oh, oh my goodness, let's shine a light on this. Your voice, you're making some valid points here. Let me hold this up to your mouth and you be the speak spokesperson, not the, I was about to say speaker and spokesperson together, but yes, <laughs> the spokesperson and you speak as the expert in this because this is your daily lived experience. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a huge advocate for like just continuing to create those kinds of spaces, those kinds of networks, and I think that's a lot of like the power building that needs to happen. And we know it's an election year, so I feel like that conversation is just naturally there, and I feel like it's a conversation that we should be having outside of election years because there are other like elections and different things that happen that impact people's communities that I think we all need to stay involved in, but. We could, I guess we could, we could have gone into this for a very long time, but I'll, I'll move us forward. So could you share an example of a particularly impactful project or initiative that you've been involved in? One that has made a significant difference in promoting health equity or raising awareness about under, underrepresented health issues. Absolutely. Um, honestly, I've worked in so many different community level projects, but one of the I think for me, because it's one of the very first public health 
interventions that I worked with. And I worked with two women who I greatly admire. Um, this is when I lived in Michigan and we actually did a physical activity and nutrition intervention and it, at an alternative school in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And um, so we came in, did physical activity, education, nutrition education. We actually had, I don't know if you're familiar with the company Barleen's, but they have like this uh, yogurt omega-3 smoothie mix that you could get at Whole Foods and a bunch of other places. And they actually donated it. And so we make smoothies and all kinds of foods for the kids. We had education for not only the children, but also their teachers and their parents as well. Um, and we saw a drastic reduction in aggressive behavior in that school year just by changing the physical activity or introducing certain physical activity and nutrition interventions into the children's lives. Um, and, you know, that was the first time that I really did that level of intervention in a community where people really had kind of just been written off. I don't know if you're very familiar with Benton Harbor, Michigan, but um, it is, there's a book and I can't, the name of it escapes me right now, but I think it's called The Tale of the Two Cities. And it talks about the juxtaposition between Benton Harbor, Michigan and St. Joseph, Michigan, because one is very, let's face it, black and impoverished and many other things that kind of go along with that when people think about that. And then St. Joseph, Michigan is right on the lake, Lake Michigan. It's beautiful. It's a tourist town. There's a beach. It's, you know, it, it's like night and day. And there is a river that goes between the two. So you go over the bridge and it is a completely different world. And so that, I think that experience really framed so many other subsequent things that I've done since then. I mean, this that was over a decade ago at this point. Um, but it really, I think that's what introduced my passion to health equity and healthcare quality was working there. <laughs> and we, we had often, I think, like the other sides of the tracks, but just like really understanding like what that means. And in many communities around the US, that is what the case is. For example, like I'm in I'm in uh, Rocky Mount, North Carolina right now, a rural part in Northeast, well, probably the most developed part in the Northeast of North Carolina. And I'm in Nash County. Rocky Mount is divided by Nash and Edgecombe County. Edgecombe is majority black. Nash is majority white. And there are no hotels on the Edgecombe side. They are, uh, the infrastructure when you go across the train tracks is a lot different on the Edgecombe side. Uh, more, most recently, they have gotten like the massive um, venue where they can host concerts and things like that. But you can see the disinvestment that has happened and what that has done for community. And we can see how like place is so in inextricably linked to health and to the outcomes that, that we see. And um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to like tie that in as well. I wish more were, were being done to address areas like this. I mean, you see these juxtapositions all across the country. You look at cities like Loma Linda, California, which is a blue zone, which is literally right across the highway from San Bernardino, California, which is a gray zone. You know, and it, I mean, literally, I, I did my doctorate at Loma Linda, so... I know the area kind of kind of well. You literally drive under I-10 and it is like, whoa. I it looks you it feels different. The type of food is different. Uh, like the food venues and like th there's trash in the parking lot and whereas you go on the other side of the street, it's squeaky clean. It's like how we're not even a fraction of a mile away. You yeah, can't, how do you explain that? It's, it's like they put up a force field and they said, like, no resources past this this line here. And I think um, definitely read Color of Law, if you haven't as yet, by uh, Richard Rothstein. Very enlightening. And I think many of us in public health are, are very, very much aware of that. 
So I wasn't going to ask you this, but you brought it up. So, cause I was watching a video of you right before we got on this call and you were talking about blue zones and you were talking about like how I believe you're saying that humans are supposed to live until 90 years old on, in, in general, at least in the U S and there are things that affect our health that make it not so. Do you want to just touch more on like blue zones or, or on that talk? And I'll also link the talk because it's, it's a, it's a good, good listen. I'm glad that you liked it. You must have went deep into YouTube. I know exactly <laughs> what video you're talking about. Um, that was like in, oh my goodness, that happened in like 2014 or something like that. <laughs> um, but yes, I gave a talk on how to live to be 100, I believe is the one you were referencing. And um, I was using some of the best, best practices, really lifestyle characteristics of different blue zone residents around the world and some of the things that they all had in common. And can you, can you define what a blue zone is before you continue? Yes. I can't think of the technical term of it off the top of my head, but basically these are the areas of the planet where people live to have basically the longest amount or greatest amount of healthy life years. And so that could be, and what I mean by healthy life years is, as we know, people are living longer and longer. However, most people around the world, they are sick sooner than before, even though they're living longer. So let's say, you know, people are getting onto medications when they're in their late 40s and 50s, but they're living to be 90. That means they're on medication for 40 plus years. That's not necessarily considered healthy living. Um, and so in these communities, you have the largest numbers of centenarians or people who live to be over 100 years old with no type of medications, no type of AIDS or anything like that. And these people are living very robust, healthy, vibrant lives. And some of the things, most of the things that I talked about are nutrition based, which is one of the reasons why I'm a nutritionist. And I did not start off as a nutritionist. It was more so as my learning started to increase. And I am an exercise physiologist, but I realized throughout my career, it's not the exercise. It's, it's, it's really not the exercise. It's not even the physical activity. It is what we put into our bodies because nutrition, food, literally sets off a, a a bunch of different enzymatic re reactions throughout your body and they're the catalyst for all kinds of things and it tells your hormones which are messengers to our cells to tell hey do this or do that or not do that and if we're putting the wrong type of fuel and or catalyst into our body you know we are creating different <laughs> outcomes <laughs> sometimes and so sometimes that you know from a policy perspective which is getting back into the equity and policy of things that's when we start talking about things like accessibility and um, even the choices that are being placed in the restaurants and the grocery stores in these neighborhoods. So anyway, so not to go too, we could talk about all kinds of different nuances of these things, but healthy living is one of those things with not just the nutrition, but physical activity. So you look at places like Loma Linda, California, which is one of the only blue zones. I think it is the only blue zone in the United States. Um, and then you have like Sardinia, you have Okinawa, you have several throughout the, the world, but they all are very physically active, not necessarily going out to the gym. They are moving, they are standing, they're walking, they're doing these things all the time. Um, and so even as it pertains to like in my clinical practice, because I specialize on hormones and many times women come to me like, hey, I'm in perimenopause and I'm gaining weight. Okay, well, let's look at what your hormones are doing. And I have different walking protocols for women, especially depending on what phase of life they're in, whether they're in menstruation years versus perimenopause versus postmenopause. It's very different. So understanding the nuances staying physically fit, staying physically active. Um, they also have very, very strong familial ties, which is something that we have kind of lost in America, especially, you know, there's a lot of lone rangers out here doing their own thing. And in some cases, 
you know, people didn't do anything to be in that situation. In other cases, people are just not focused on their families. They're not, they don't go home for the holidays. And sometimes that's by choice. And, you know, I'm not saying that people don't have the right to make these choices. However, having a community of people who you can rely on and have that type of social reliance and and safety, that has a lot to do with our longevity as well. Um, There's spiritual ties. Almost every single one of them believes in a higher entity. Um, Yeah, there's there's so much. There's so much. But they all share commonalities. (laughs) And I think it's really worthwhile for us to study those. Absolutely. And I've I've come across the the team, the Blue Zone. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Blue Zone something else. There's a book out there that's in my Amazon cart that I have not bought as yet because I have a whole host of other books to read. Um, but I think it is it is very fascinating when we think about these like populations of people that just tend to have people that are healthy and are careful, like not just living long, but living long and healthy lives where they're actually being able to have a good quality of life. People are gardening in their later years and doing all these things that we think people shouldn't do in those years. And, and I think go back to your point of like just understanding what are those dynamics there and how can we like systematize that in a cultural context to different places so that we can have you might you might live to 100 but you can live a lot longer than we are now and live a lot healthier than we are now exactly yes and have fun life is fun it should feel good i i've had I, I actually have one particular client that I'm thinking of. I remember she's she's in her 60s now, and she told me that she did not. We went we did some work in um, fixing a couple of diff- different things that she had uh, going on. She was like, I didn't realize how bad I felt before until I really evaluated how good I feel now. And she was like, I have not felt this well since I was in my 20s. So that's saying for 40 years, she has been living, feeling poorly, and she thought that was normal. And there's so many people out there who are living that way. No, your body should feel good. Aging is not, should not be associated with achy joints and being in pain all the time. That is a symptom of disease, not of aging. So... (laughs) appreciate this and once again we could talk about this topic for a very long time as well um but we have to get more into your career story so and before we do that what does public health mean to you Ooh, okay so public health <laughs> is not it's not just a profession for me it is literally a commitment to the complete well-being and i say complete for a reason uh, the complete well-being of individuals, households, communities. Um, and it's making sure that the systems that we touch, and I can go into all kinds of rabbit holes about systems, and I'm not going to, all of these different systems that we touch, that we are a part of every single day, are equitable and that they address the appropriate barriers to actually improve the health outcomes that we've alluded to in our conversation today. And it's it's addressing Um, all of the dimensions of wellness. So the physical, spiritual, social, environmental, uh, occupational, uh, mental, emotional, whatever, financial, all of these aspects of what makes us a person, a human being. And so as I share my journey on this podcast today, I'm really reminded of the countless stories and faces and moments that have fueled my passion for this field because I did not start out with the goal of being a public health practitioner. I started out actually wanting to be a dentist. That's a whole other conversation. Um, And so (laughs) I believe though, by sharing these experiences, and that's why I'm so thankful for your podcast, that myself and all the others out there who are listening and who have also contributed can highlight the importance of public health Um, but also inspire other people to recognize the profound impact that public health has on other people. And so that's how, from my perspective, that is how we are going to make a meaningful difference in 
the health and well-being of our society. Echo that. Love it. So you got your bachelor's of biology at Oakwood University, is it? Mm -hmm. right in there? Okay. So you got your bachelor's of biology at Oakwood University. Tell us about that thought process. Okay, so um, when I went to college, I honestly did not know what I wanted to major in. And, and this is how, as a, as a woman of faith, like, this is how I know this was divinely orchestrated, because all throughout elementary school, high school, all, my, my favorite class was health class. It was health and physical activity. That was always my favorite class. And it wasn't just because we got to, you know, PE doesn't have assignments. That wasn't it because I was a straight A student. I just loved learning about health. Like, it made me happy. Just, it's like, ooh, yes. So, I mean, science was a thing too. I love science. I still love science. I will sit there and geek out on documentaries and just, it just makes me happy. Um, and so I chose biology because back then, public health wasn't as prevalent of a career choice. It was really just medicine, dentistry, maybe occupational therapy, physical therapy. Those were like the big buckets, you know? So um, Oakwood also has a very good science program. And so that is one of the reasons why I went there. And so I, I had a lot of different opportunities. Even at the undergrad level, I was able to participate in a research um, internship called uh, Rise Eye Care. And I did a summer internship at Western Michigan University where I tested some lipid vaccine, um, a lipid vaccine on uh, male August rats. Yes, I actually did animal testing. I'm not too proud of that fact, but it was an experience. Um, and I discovered that that is not my area of Nope, that's not for me. And so <laughs> I had the opportunity, though, to present my research at um, Abercams, which is the annual biomedical research conference for minority students. And um, that was my first real introduction to research. And so that kind of started opening up my mind to several things. And yeah, from there, I went on to do... I. I did get into dental school and went for a little bit and I discovered that I hated dentistry. And for any dentist who is listening to this right now, you have a wonderful profession and you are needed. And we, yes, the oral cavity is very important. It just was not the career choice for me. And so I was like, oh no, we gotta find something else. <laughs> and so, so, but yeah, that, that was, that was Oakwood and it was, a life-changing experience for many different ways. And some of my oldest, and even still some of my best friends, most of my best friends are people who I met during those years. And before we get to the dental school stuff, did you have any undergrad takeaways that you wanted to share? I, yes, I, I yes, absolutely. So any up and coming students out there who are listening to this, if you make a C, for me, the first C I ever made in my life was in honors biology, and I was devastated because that's my major. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my major, and I had never made a C before. I was a straight A student. I maybe had made one or two Bs in my life at that point, so to make a C the world was over. It was over. And honestly, and I, I know looking back, it sounds so juvenile and trivial. However, at that time, it really made, it, it damaged my self-esteem to a certain degree. And I started to not view myself as smart um, simply because I made one C. Yeah. Um, so my word of advice would be to remember that your life is just starting, whether you're at undergrad, master's level, even doctoral level, if you're defending your dissertation. This is the first piece of work you are going to put out to the world. You're going to have 50 trillion other things that you're going to put out to the world. <laughs> just focus on graduating. That's it. Just focus on graduating. Do your best. God will provide the rest of it. Just, just keep going. Don't let one small little blip on your record impact you because honestly, and I, and I can say this with my whole heart, 
I almost didn't go to grad school because of the perception that I thought I was just not smart. And clearly that's not the case, but yes, that, that would be my takeaway to give. I, I appreciate that. And I hope if someone is out there and resonates with that, that they still take the step forward because a grade does not define you, especially if it's like, yeah, it does not define you. You're so much more than that. So uh, keep on persevering. We are rooting for you. So uh, thank you for being open about that. You are welcome. Absolutely. And did you go directly from undergrad into dental school or did you do the clinical office manager or quality control manager jobs pre before that? No, I went straight into dental school. Um, then I left promptly after about <laughs> six, seven months and was like, when then the, the rationale for that was my first year was paid for and I did not want to, I don't know if anyone's familiar with how much it costs to go to dental school, but it is a lot of money. And I did not want to pay said money uh, out of my pocket because then I felt like I would be forced to finish all of dental school. So I quit that and actually did my MBA in healthcare administration next and had a variety of different jobs. And that is how I got into healthcare administration. Okay. That, um, that makes sense. And I feel like one of the, the biggest lessons that we have in life uh, especially when you're like early in your career thinking about things is like figuring out what you don't like. And sometimes that just happens like when you get into dental school, when you get into medical school and you just realize, oh, like this is a lot of years and a lot of other factors just come up and you realize that I'm not really as passionate as I thought I was around this topic. And like, I think that's fine. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm also glad that you, you were given that like time of that year to understand, oh, like I'm not paying for this, but this is not what I want to do. I don't want to pay for this. Um, and, and understand that is very, very key as well. So what was that thought process between like, so actually let me, let me get this. So, so you said that that C in undergrad made you, made you not think about, was that grad school as in dental school or was that grad school as in your MBA? That was period. Okay. I, so so mm -hmm, you go, you go ahead. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, pursued dentistry. And honestly, when I first applied, I did not think I was going to get in. And then when I got in, it was like, oh, okay. And then I met all of my cool co um, classmates and everything. And I'm still friends with many of them to this day too. And, um, you know, it was like, oh, wow, we're like intellectually on the same level. Maybe I'm smart. And it just, like that confidence started to come back. <laughs> I know it sounds so silly, but it was... Yeah. I mean, and then I also, I didn't mention this. I also went to college when I was 16. So there was also some maturity and growth just mindset wise that needed to happen there too. So I was, I was, I was a kid. So that plays a part as well. Understood. Understood. Okay. So given the the loss of confidence from the C I'm guessing like maybe losing some confidence in yourself and like, Oh, I'm going to dental school and then realizing this really isn't for me. What was that, that thought process, that decision to say, I want to apply and do an MBA. And how did you know, like, that was the thing that you wanted to do going forward? To be honest with you at that time, I did not know what the heck I was doing. I was just, I need to do something. And I did know enough people who had graduated with a degree in biology to know what kind of the options were at that time. You know, again, public health wasn't really a big thing. So getting an MPH wasn't a, something that ever crossed my mind at any point in time. Um, I knew that people either went into research, they went to grad school to become a physician or dentist or pharmacist or something like that, or they ended up working in the hospital. And so I was like, I like, medicine. I think this is cool. I could see myself doing this and healthcare administrators make good money. So I was like, Hey, and, and it's an MBA. It's a transferable degree that I can go and do anything in my life. And so I was looking at it from that perspective. And so that was, that was the rationale behind it. 
Sorry. Makes makes sense. Makes sense. So you got your MBA at University of Phoenix in healthcare administration. During mm-hmm. your time there, you were a medical services specialist, team leader at the Georgia Department of Human Resources. Can you talk about that experience? Absolutely. I so at that time, um, I was I moved back home, which was Dallas, Texas, is where I'm from originally. And I was with my parents, and one of my friends was moving to Atlanta. She's like, I need a roommate. Okay. Great. So I started, uh, I moved to Atlanta. I did not even have a job when I moved to Atlanta. I just moved, packed up my car and just got on the road. And so that was one of the first positions that I, I received. I, and I started thinking about it. Okay, well, what are some things that I'm good at? I've always been an athlete. I ran track and field for a very long time. was very fast, um, runner. And, um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm used to that type of dynamic. So I was like, okay, well, let me, what about physical activity? What about, uh, uh, physical therapy? And so I literally started calling physical therapy clinics and told them like, Hey, I am a new graduate. I have my bachelor's degree in biology. I am a former athlete, blah, blah, blah. And I literally sold myself on the phone. And that is how I got my first job. Take notes, everyone. Take notes. I love that. <laughs> like, I have bills to pay. We have to get a job. Hey, desperation makes us do necessary things sometimes. Absolutely. And so because I was working full time and I, you know, I didn't know much about how to go to school full time and a traditional academic setting and work full time back then. The only, there were a handful of schools that allowed adult learners to go part-time to school. And so um, I chose the University of Phoenix because at that time their their program was accredited and it was doing well. I know since then many things have happened with that school, Um, but I'm thankful for the things that I, I learned. And actually some of the faculty that I had there were amazing giants in their industry in healthcare. And some of them really poured into me and became mentors to me. So even though I I still to this day, I've never met them in person. Um, So I had a great experience. And what were some of the big takeaways from your MBA program? Uh, One of the big takeaways was that I absolutely hate accounting. Uh, (laughs) That that (laughs) is not for me. Um, No, but, but really though, I, I learned a lot about healthcare as a, a from a business perspective and just understanding the nuances of what it takes to run a clinic, what it takes to run a hospital even. And I know that people have their, their thoughts and I have my own thoughts, especially after working and transitioning to healthcare quality later in my career. Um, however, those principles I think are very important to know even as a physician or a nurse, just understanding the operations side of healthcare, I think it's very important. And after your MBA, you decided to pursue a master of science in fitness and health promotion at Georgia State University, while also being a clinical, though having a clinical internship at the clinical exercise physiology at Emory University. What was that thought process? So after I left hospital administration, uh, well, there was a distinct reason why I left. Um, I actually had, I actually, this was pre-ACA, um, and I actually had a patient who died. Um, it was a older gentleman. He had come in, this was before there were no pre-existing conditions and all of that stuff. So just to set the pe- the listeners frame of reference. Um, it had gotten to the point where the hospital ha- didn't want to help him financially anymore because he had basically maxed out his benefits because of his health conditions. And this patient died about an, a week after being released. And so, you know, you, you work in the hospital and you have certain patients who come in frequently, you start to develop a relationship with them. You develop a relationship with their families and because I was privy to some conversations about this patient that I did not agree with, and I knew could have circumvented some things that he experienced, it wasn't anything illegal. However, at that time, again, pre-ACA, 
th this is what it was. And at that point I was like, I, I don't like this. I don't like being on the business side of healthcare. I want to do something else. And I actually had the opportunity to go to Georgia state and pursue my master's in exercise science degree for free. And so I transitioned to being a medical social worker that I, I actually worked through that time. I actually worked for um, defects, it's called defects in Atlanta, Georgia, Department of uh, Family and Children's Services under the Department of Public Health there in Atlanta. And so I was a medical social worker. And so that is what kind of introduced me to public health. And that is what changed my entire career trajectory because I thought, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a career in exercise, which I did eventually do to some degree because um, I do have my MS in exercise physiology and I did my clinical training at the Emory Clinic. Um, and so that was technically at the tail end of my academic career there at Georgia State. And so they had a partnership program with Georgia State and Emory. So that's how that worked. Um, but yeah, that's that's how that all happened. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear and just like illuminating because so many people think it's like just an easy cut out path to get in where you are and like the decisions in life. And sometimes it's, it's not like that. And sometimes we find out about public health in weird ways and find out that there are ways to impact people in just new ways that we have never heard about. And I think that's the, uh, I guess, the beauty of life in, in some regards that you're able to find it out and find your path and do that kind of work. So uh, pretty cool, pretty cool. And while, while you and your, your uh, master's at that time, you also did a lifestyle and health scientist at CDC. You were a lifestyle and health scientist at, C at CDC? No, the way this happened. And this is why it's so important to build relationships with people, like genuine relationships. So while I was at my internship um, at Emory, one of my favorite patients who is deceased now um, at this point in time, however, she was, I, I worked in cardiac rehabilitation and she had had a heart attack. She was a heart attack survivor. And so, you know, we're working together. We're in her little cycle ergometer. We doing all the exercise classes. We just have fun. And we just talk about life. We talk about all kinds of things. Um, and so one day she was just like, so have you thought about next steps and what you want to do? No, I really haven't you know right now i'm just trying to finish my internship i just try to graduate for real i mean it technically graduated but i still had to finish all of my hours to you know maintain your certifications and all of that stuff so she was like i want to introduce you to my daughter okay sure i did not know her daughter worked at the cdc so i met her daughter and that's ended up that's how i ended up getting my job <laughs> So long story short, I kind of cut that story short, but that's how I ended up working across the street at the CDC, um, right there off of Clifton, because it's literally catacornered across the street. And so, um, you know, again, it's, I don't take anything that's happened in my life as circumstantial. I truly believe that I was in the right place at the right time. And so that's, that's what happened. Awesome. Yeah. Everyone just continue to be kind to people. You never know who who knows who and who's whose daughter or mother or dad or so yeah, just be kind to people out there. Yes, absolutely. Uh-huh. I can tell you countless stories about relationship building and how people are just like, Oh, I just thought about you. Would you be interested in such and such? Sure. <laughs> you know? Uh so yeah, that's that's the thing. And so um, while I was at the CDC, that's when I actually started my doctorate in public health. So I did a hybrid program and um, my boss and my team there at the CDC was very just understanding because I'd had to do intensives and go out to California. And so, um, you know, that that all worked very well. It worked out. 
And what was that thought process of deciding to get your doctor of public health? Because you said you learned about public health during your master's of science in fitness and health promotion. Now you're working at the CDC and well, like, was it just like a natural, oh, I can do this? Or like, what was that thought process for you? I mean, you're around all of these super cool people who are doing these amazing things. And I worked in the division of uh, physical activity. Um, it's division of nutrition, physical activity and obesity. And so, you know, I'm learning, like I'm information overload. It's just like, I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know that was a career. I didn't know I could do this. And I'm just, because they're speaking to my natural passions and it's just like, oh, I can make a career. This is what I've been wanting to do. And I didn't even know this was it kind of thing. And so it was a no brainer for me to go that public health was that next step. And so, and I also saw how all of my different interests and experiences up until that point, cause I was still in my early twenties at this point. Um, I saw how all of these different things tied together because when I was at the CDC, I was doing physical activity research. So like our physical activity norms, of how many uh, minutes of physical activity you should get and all of those types of things. That's the type of research I was doing and implementing things like the presidential pala challenge. And I remember I did an IHS um, physical activity celebration thing. And there's all these people in like tr different tribes from across the country came to Atlanta and we're, and I was just like, oh my gosh, because part of my heritage is actually Native American. And so that was all, that also was a very memorable experience for me too. So yeah, it was just, it just was full circle at that point. And I just knew what my next step should be. And what did the intensive that you had to travel to California for look like? Well, it was really in the summertime. Uh, you got to pick when you traveled. And so I kind of did it around my work schedule. At that time, my daughter was just born. So I had a newborn baby. Like it was, it was a lot, <laughs> it was a lot going on, but yeah, the program really worked for me and um, shout out to Loma Linda. Uh, at that time, Loma Linda had one of the only hybrid public health programs at that time. And it was also one of the only hybrid, I think at that time there's three DRPH program specifically that was hybrid like that, because I knew I wanted to do a DRPH versus a PhD. And can you walk us through that thought process? Yes, absolutely. I knew I wanted to practice. I don't, I, even though the theory and all that stuff that I alluded to earlier is important. Absolutely. It's still important. Even as a DRPH, you can't, you can't do public health practice without knowing that stuff, but I knew, especially after my years of being a social worker, I wanted to work with people. I wanted to work directly hands on, be a public health practitioner and not just a researcher. And I'm not saying that if you just have a PhD, you can't do both. However, you know, the programs are designed differently. You're designed to be a public health practitioner. <laughs> Right. As I say, you have to be a little more intentional in what you're doing in your PhD program to like just make it more of a natural fit in doing that. But you absolutely could still do it. But yeah, as you say, in the program for the DRPH is like public health leadership, practitionership, and just thinking about like how how do I bring what I what I need to a leadership position in public health. Mm -hmm. uh, so I appreciate that. And I think this was also during your your DRPH. You worked at Andrews University in multiple positions. Can you? Just talk briefly about those. Yeah, I actually moved because um, at the time I was married. And so he went to grad school there. And so I was very blessed and fortunate to get a faculty position. And so I was the director of fitness and exercise science and transitioned that program over into a full BS program. Um, also helped to establish the MPH program there. Uh, went through the whole CEF accreditation process, helped write see accreditation documents, created courses. Um, I created the physical activity epidemiology course um, as well. I taught a couple of courses, taught a lot of courses actually. Um, and so, yeah. And so during that time we had a transition in leadership, which 
Shout out to my big sis, Dr. Shereen Brown Frazier, who was our department chair. And so while she was coming in, um, I before she came in, I was serving as the assistant departmental chair to kind of just help with some of the financial implications of the department. That's awesome. It seems like you were able to accomplish a lot during your time there. Mm -hmm. I did. And so and after you, mm -hmm, you go ahead. From there, I went on to do my postdoc at the University of Maryland. And so that is how I got to the DMV. <laughs> and, and how did you think through taking on a postdoc? Okay, so I didn't plan on doing a postdoc. Let me be very clear. I was actually doing research for one of my courses and I was doing research on programs that were kind of having the same type, addressing the same type of health outcomes that I was curious about. So I actually sent an email to my postdoc mentor, Dr. Mullins, who I'm, who still, I mean, such an amazing human being. Okay. That's a whole other conversation. Um, he still is my mentor to this day. I still, he still, Hey, we need to meet this month. I need to hear what you're doing. What are you planning? Blah, blah, blah. And it's been literally almost a decade and this man still checks on me. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's amazing to have these type of people in your life. But anyway, so I sent him an email and I don't remember all of the back and forth or whatever, because I was asking about his research and his programs and some kind of way we got on the phone and we were talking at, through his research and he asked me, have you ever considered a postdoc? No. What would that look like? I don't know. Again, I'm a first generation college graduate. So to some degree, much of this has been made up along the way because I was not exposed to it growing up. Um, and if I was, I didn't know about it. I, people just didn't talk about it for those who I might have encountered maybe at church or something like that, who had higher advanced degrees. But most of those people were lawyers or something like that. They weren't in the health field. Um, so I went through the process, applied and started doing my postdoc. And so my postdoc research is uh, around health, health services research. And so most of our, um, he has, a lot of different grants, but this particular grant that I did my research on was actually funded by ARC in Washington, DC. And so that kind of set the groundwork for my later career moves in healthcare quality. And after your postdoc, you worked in a few, well, you worked in many roles. I'm going to list four of them out. You can talk about whichever one stand out to you, whichever experiences you want to. So you're a population health program director at Healthcare Dynamics International, technical expert panel member at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, clinical quality program administrator at Anthem Incorporated, program director, quality management at AmeriHealth Caritas. Yes. So... I will lump these together because I could talk for days about each one. Um, but one thing that I, I took away from these is that number one, I love working in healthcare quality. I love looking at clinical outcomes and seeing how we can improve. Like for instance, when I was at AmeriHealth Caritas in DC, one of the um, programs that we created was a A1C um, mail-in I forgot what we call it, but basically mailing in your um, samples that way because many people just weren't getting their medication. So we had the pharmacy send everything to their home and then they send everything back and it just made, it eliminated the accessibility barriers. And so we were able to indirectly target things like different SDOHs and um, health inequities and all kinds of different things. So it was a really great opportunity in all of these roles to be creative. Um, when I worked for Anthem, I absolutely loved that role because I got to literally talk to all of the stakeholders to figure out what are the barriers in healthcare. I got to talk to patients, to the community members, to caregivers. You know, I'm going to the clinic. I get to be in and out of the uh, out of the community. I get to go to like coalition meetings at libraries and 
that was really cool. And then um, I did their big performance improvement project every year where we wrote to the Department of Healthcare Finance and like, hey, this is all of the things that we're working on. These are how we're addressing our care gaps, blah, 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 blah. Then you, you know, you meet their confidence interval ratings and it's a whole science behind it. I don't want to get into all of that today. But nonetheless, I discovered that addressing gaps in care and barriers to care is something I am very passionate about throughout this story, you've like done things. You're like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. But you have, you have to do something to know that you like it or not. And I think it's so important to try out those things. And then like from that, you are thinking about the exercise science and then finding public health and then realizing the people in the CDC were so smart and just doing things like aligned with your passion. Like it's just, it's just fascinating to hear like the progression of the story and like you're now finding your, I guess your shoes and now you're about to run off and do like all this amazing work. <laughs> so, so to speak, so to speak. So, so it's, it's really cool to hear. And after those roles, you were executive program director at Colorado Technical University. So tell us about that experience. Yeah. So, um, you know, the pandemic came and I decided during that time that I wanted to be closer to my mom because my father passed away a couple of years ago from diabetes complications. And so my mom became a widow, you know, during COVID-19, she was by herself and, and just, you know, becoming a fairly recent widow and then having to be in isolation. That's kind of hard, especially after being married for almost 40 years. That's, that's, that's a big adjustment for anyone. Uh, so my daughter and I ended up leaving Maryland and coming down to Texas and ended up staying. And so at some point, and the only reason why I left Amerihealth Health is because all of the senior leaders were called back to the office. And so if you're a people manager, which I had a whole team of people, I had to go back. And I was like, I don't want to go back. I'm going to stay here. And so um, I ended up working in curriculum development which is, you know, what an EP does, EPD does there. And so um, I was over their healthcare administration program because that's one area, that's another area, you know, obviously I have some passion in because of my years working as a hospital administrator and just making sure, I think it's really important for those of us who have gained experience in the field to go back and help educate those who are coming through the ranks and learning. Um, to understand or help them understand the nuances of what's happening. Um, and that's the only way this is going to be fixed because yes, there are broken things in the system, but if no one ever goes back to fix it or tra help to train people on the, these inconsistencies and these uh, areas that need to be improved, then why we don't have room to complain. You know, you can't, I don't like complainers. <laughs> That's just me in a nutshell. So if you ever present a problem to me, always come with a solution. You presenting a solution with the problem, okay, now we can have a conversation. But when you're just talking about problems, after a while, it's like, okay, well, you know, how do we fix this problem kind of thing? So that was more so the rationale there. And so it was an interesting experience, but I, um, you know, transition back into research. And so I've had a variety of roles. At, I'm actually at UT Southwestern, which is very full circle because that is also where I was born. And so being able to do research and give back to the community that raised me is, it's pretty cool, you know? And so <laughs> I've done a variety of different things there. And um, so now I am, I was the senior population science research manager. And so I helped develop partnerships with community organizations, um, schools, hospitals, universities, businesses, all kinds of stakeholders. And then also oversaw a variety of different research projects um, and helped to train. I had 31 people who reported to me. <laughs> I didn't really enjoy that part. But, you know, part of it was communicating research findings and contributing to the larger evidence base of research that's out there. Um, but I have since assumed a new role also at UT Southwestern, 
in improvement and implementation science. And so, and I love implementation science. It's, it's kind of a new war term in public health, right? Um, but I am really responsible for supporting the capacity building phase and the implementation science training across the health system especially here in Dallas-Fort Worth, because this area, we have a lot of amazing hospitals and a lot of amazing people doing amazing things. However, it's very, very siloed, very siloed. And especially as it pertains to the two cities, Dallas and Fort Worth are both huge cities and they're right next to each other. And so, and then you have all these buffer cities all around it. So this area is, I think it's like the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country. Um, and so, you know, it's really nice to be able to help with leading some of these extra, extramurally funded projects and working together, working with the population health side, working with primary care, working with research, and then also, um, you know, really just getting the word out of how do we make some of these clinical interventions, some of this research, how do we tailor it to certain communities to reduce health disparities, of course, but then also make it just culturally relevant and practical where we are improving outcomes based on what we know versus, because we we don't always do that very well. So anyway, that's what I do now. <laughs> well, congratulations on the transition promotion, how, however that worked out. Firstly, what are you most excited for in this new role? I'm excited. Well, the School of Public Health is brand spanking new, and this is the first uh, school, the first new school that has uh, UT has created in the past 50 years. So that in itself is very exciting. And it's also very exciting to work in a brand new School of Public Health because people don't always get that option. And so to create something on the ground level where you are helping to be a part of building the culture and setting the standards and, um, you know, building the curriculum and hiring just, it's just interesting. And you don't always get that opportunity in your career. So I'm super excited. There's lots of new things all the time. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is super excited. And like they have found a perfect person to help in supporting that work. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that school. Hopefully some students from there listen to the podcast. And uh, yeah, love, love, love to just continue to support the, the next generation of public health people. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. So before we move on to the Furious Five, where can people connect with you? They can find me online. Um, so on pretty much every social media platform, my handle is at the at sign, Dr. Jazzy Fit. That's J-A-Z-Z-Y-F-I-T. D-R-J-A-Z-Z-Y-F-I-T. Um, and they can also visit my website, drgiselmartin.com. Awesome. And I'll be sure to link those in the bio. Uh, and some of them, I guess, will be in the description. You can click it easily, but you could go to the show notes and get all the links to everything else. And I guess we, we didn't talk about this. So I'll ask it before the Furious Five. You spoke about being an athlete doing track. You spoke about, well, we didn't speak about, but you were a business owner for a, a company around wellness, fitness for almost eight years. And now your hashtag is like Dr. Jazzy Fit. Tell us, like, what what's the importance of fitness, of wellness? I know we spoke about, like, the blue zones earlier, but, like, what does that mean for you, as well as how have you incorporated that into your life? Absolutely. Uh, I'm really big on, like, I mentioned you know, most of the eight dom domains of wellness earlier. I am very big on holistic living. So not just, I feel like sometimes we get so siloed just on one thing. I'm really big on just healthy living, period. So that's not just our food, it's not just our nutrition, it's also how we treat our homes. You know, the, the even things down to like your detergent that you wash your clothes in. I use clean detergent, I use clean makeup, all these different things, you know, obesogens and taking care of my skin with your skin being the largest organ of your body. Um, making sure your home is clean and clutter-free. Like I have plants all throughout my house. 
I love plants. I am a plant mama. I call them my green babies. Um, so anyone who ever wants to talk plants with me, let's talk. Um, <laughs> so, but, um, you know, as far as that, I teach people how to make health work for them. And so my tagline is making health easy because, or health made easy because you look at, like, if you have an ailment or something that's out there, you Google it and all of these different things pop up and they're all conflicting and it's confusing and it's frustrating. And, you know, I understand why people just quit. They just give up. And so I wanted to create a safe space for people to come and get credible information, whether it's from me or whether it's from one of my partner coaches, because I do partner with other people and I have other people on my team that, um, you know, there's going to be somebody who you resonate with. There's going to be somebody who you can relate to who might share a similar story as you. And so I wanted to create that space for people. And so I do still have it. It started off as um, preventive fitness solutions. And then I transitioned it and now it's called the Viv Wellness Academy. Viv is, I got it from the Haitian Creole uh, word of life. And so it's just life wellness academy, whether it's just having social support, whether it's having healthy new recipes to try, um, whether it's needing to know exactly what to do, how to move your body. I wanted to provide those resources at a fairly low cost. And so I do have different tiered programs and pricing. So that way, you know, the equity piece is still addressed even within my own private businesses and practice. Love that. Appreciate you sharing. And I think that that is like just that wellness and the holistic approach to it. Like when you do understand the social determinants of health and just how they impact our lives and how health is so dynamic. I think taking that holistic approach and really ensuring that we are feeding into all of those different factors that we need to be healthy is something that should just become our lifestyle and or at least we should try to get it as much as our lifestyle as as is possible. And I think like there is like no one way to be healthy is is what we always preach is like find the things that are important to you and try to do those things and then fill in the those the different factors that we spoke about. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. You are welcome. Happy to share. Awesome. Well, I hope you're happy to share for the last five questions, the previous five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student in trying to pursue a career in public health? I would say that, I mean, it's going to sound so cliche, but the sky is the limit. If I truly believe that if you have the vision and the passion to do something, it doesn't have to have a roadmap. You can create your own path. You can literally forge your own path. I mean, you just heard my background. It was very, it was all over the place. It seemed to be all over the place, but everything worked together to literally, because I had the insight and the discipline to say no to things that did not serve me when they did not serve me, I ended up kind of following my own path and doing what literally brings me joy every day. And so I would say, you know, if you follow that same joy type of mindset, like you're going to continue to find things that bring you joy. So whether it's research, whether it's private practice, whatever area of public health you decide that you want to go in, do something that you enjoy that brings you the joy and fulfillment. Because I truly believe part of the reason why I do a really great job at what I do is because I enjoy it and I love it. And so I'm blessing others. It's blessing me at the same time. And it's just a really good, happy feeling type of situation. So, I, and I want that for everybody. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? I would say, um, for my back, for my, particular position, whether it was the senior research manager position or an implementation science, I would really encourage you to have a background and understand healthcare management. You need to understand the hospitals and how that whole process works. 
um, the the departmental, the administrative, the how this the research ties in with the practice, like what we talked about. Um, but then you also need to understand research. You need to be able to conduct research yourself. Yeah, I mean, you need to be able to like I had a project that I literally just finished this week that I did not anticipate that was a, a qualitative uh, research. Uh, type of situation. It was actually a strategic plan. <laughs> I had never done a strategic plan before, but because, you know, I know how to do research, I knew how to do this. I knew how to analyze data and analyze all of the different responses. And so I, you need to have a very strong background in both qualitative and quantitative research. And sometimes we get so caught up just on the quantitative side, the words have power it, the the numbers sometimes are what gets you the dollars, but the words are where the powers is. And so when you marry the two together and you have the ability to work with both, that makes you a very strong candidate. 100% agree with that. Number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Something I am improving, I am working on improving on is it actually has nothing to do with public health of others. It has everything, everything to do with the public health of myself. Uh, <laughs> oh, public health of myself is a thing. Um, but yes, I am working on not putting myself on the back burner. And I think this, some, this is something that many of us, especially throughout the pandemic, really struggled with, especially if you work in healthcare, whether as a practitioner, as a public health, scientist or, you know, a clinician, that was something that for me kind of got put on the back burner and I am focused on, all right, I have to do all the things that I am teaching everyone else to do. Um, because it sometimes that's so easy to do when you are giving so much of yourself and you don't take that time and maintain that balance to, you know, make sure that you're good too. And that's important. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, well, I would recommend this podcast, especially to any I mean, people who are just starting out in public health, but also those who are working in public health. Maybe there are things that um, you're working on that need to be amplified, or maybe you find some new research partners or, you know, like, teamwork and all those types of things. So that's for sure. Um, I love that you mentioned the color of law earlier. I actually have that book. It's on my shelf. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a great um, book, but there's, there is a, an audio book and I, I have the book as well, but these days for me to read the amount of books that I read, I listen to a lot of audio books and it's called the healing codes. And I have really been enjoying that book very, very much. Um, I would also recommend my program, The Body Goals Blueprint, for anyone who is struggling with hormones, especially Black women. If you're struggling with your food and you're struggling with your hormones, I would encourage you to check that program out. Awesome. I will be sure to link those below for anyone that is interested. And then number five, last but not least, if there is one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self, what would it be? I would caution myself about um, just stress and remind myself and reassure myself that you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Everything that you set out in life, you're going to accomplish. You might not see the end. You don't know how you're going to get there, but sometimes the how doesn't matter. It's the what, and sometimes it's just a matter of when. The how literally is, I think, and I think for many people, because stress, let's face it, almost every single root health issue starts, it stems from stress, almost every single one. And I think from my perspective and from what I've learned, um, we stress over the how, and that's the part that is mostly out of our control. Don't don't stress over the how. Just know your purpose, know what you're doing, know that everything 
you know, again, I am a Christian. I, as a Christian woman, I do not believe that God gives you vision without providing, without giving you the provision to do it. It will always, always come because you're called to do this. So that is it. That's my advice. <laughs> the vision comes with provision. Love it. Love it. But I really enjoyed today's conversation, Dr. Giselle Martin. This was awesome. Awesome to, to learn more about your career journey, more, more about your insights and all, all the different paths that you've taken to learning and learning what you didn't like as well as learning what you liked and to see the impact that you're making. Congrats once again on the new role, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. I have enjoyed this. Awesome. I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that. How housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching or listening to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet. Leave a five-star review and share it with a friend. Greatly appreciate you. Bye.